Welcome to War Room, the official podcast of the U.S. Army War College online journal, graciously supported by the Army War College Foundation. Please join the conversation at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. We hope you enjoy the program. Hello, and welcome to A Better Peace, the podcast of War Room, the U.S. Army War College online journal. I'm Colonel Buck Haberichter, a member of the editorial staff and faculty member at the U.S. Army War College, and I'm glad you joined us today. We at the War College recognize the significance history plays in the development of leaders at all levels, and that means not a year goes by that doesn't mark an important anniversary for some historical event. And 2018 is no different. We're particularly interested in an anniversary that will come in July this year, marking the 70th anniversary of an Executive Order 9981, which abolished organizational racial discrimination in the U.S. Armed Forces and eventually led to the end of segregation in the military. This was a truly momentous order, and it prompts us to consider the role that race and the fight for civil rights has played in American history broadly and in American military history more specifically. Today on the podcast, we welcome two guests to discuss the integration order and its continuing legacy. First, we have Professor Chuck Allen, who is a retired Army colonel and now Professor of Leadership and Cultural Studies at the U.S. Army War College. And he is in the studio with Major General William J. Walker, who is the Commanding General, District of Columbia National Guard. He is responsible for operational readiness and command and control of the District of Columbia Army and Air National Guard units. Major General Walker is also retired from the Federal Civil Service, where he served as a special agent with the Drug Enforcement Agency. Currently, he also serves as the Vice Chairman on the Board of Directors for the Young Marines, a nonprofit organization that helps develop young men and women as they mature into responsible citizens. Let's turn now to their conversation. Hello, I'm Chuck Allen. Hi, I'm William Walker. Thanks for joining me today. I'm thrilled to be here. As you know, this summer is the 7th anniversary of the Executive Order 9981. So I'd like to ask you to start by relating to us how your life has been affected by EO 9981. What is the legacy of this change? So my life has been materially affected, impacted by this executive order. From what I have read about life for African Americans before this executive order by President Truman, I doubt if I would be here now. In my opinion, the executive order was the beginning of the social experiment and the forerunner of the civil rights movement that uh, began in the 50s and 60s. So what is the legacy of this change then in your life? So I am a Brigadier General in um, the District of Columbia National Guard. I am the Acting Commanding General for the District of Columbia National Guard. A career National Guard officer. I was a DEA, Drug Enforcement Administration Special Agent for over 32 years. And I rose from GS-7 to a member of the Senior Executive Service, and I retired as a Deputy Assistant Administrator. That would not have been possible, in my opinion, without this executive order. That's very impressive. American citizens often have a complex feeling about the United States, and by extension, the institutions of the United States government. For African Americans, Martin Luther King Jr. pointed out in his I Have a Dream speech that America is a nation with high aspirations, but it has often failed to deliver on its promises. How has your experience affected your view of the nation that you've served? So my my experience is um, when I became a DEA special agent, I was the only African American in my class. So I knew work had to be done, but I was afforded the opportunity to progress. I had mentors and I listened to them. So the experience that I, I have had as an African American, both in the DEA and, as, and in the United States Army and the Army National Guard, has been one where the dream has come true. Dr. King's dream for me has come true, and I had high aspirations, and I was able to meet those aspirations. Thank you. How has your service been received by your non-military members in the African-American community? Um, It's kind of complex. Most of my uh, friends are extremely proud of my accomplishments as a Army officer. Some of them have this bewilderment that I would serve the country as a soldier when they don't believe that America is still treating African Americans on an equal, in an equal way. So there's some complexity there, but overall, I am well received in my community. So how do you respond to their questions and challenges? 
Well, I, I tell them that they, that who I am, I was able to leverage the military with DEA and DEA with the military. So for me, it was a the army was everything I thought it would be, and it proved to be. It, it helped me to become the leader that I am today. So so for me, I tell most of um, those that I know from my community, give the army a chance, and you'll be amazed at what you will become as an individual. That's my experience also. So where do you think the U.S. military is headed in terms of racial diversity? I think that in the United States military, and I'll, I'll limit my, my response to the United States Army, I think we're headed in the right direction, and I think we're on the right path, and it, it is always about leadership. Right now, the United States Army is uh, privileged to have General Mark A. Milley as our chief of staff, and he is all about having the right people in the right seat. We're at an all-time high of African American, at the African Americans serving at the three-star level. I believe we have ten African American three-star generals, two of which are women, and in my nearly 37 years in in the uniform, I don't recall that many African Americans uh, in at that most senior level of the United States Army. Do you think that's sustainable over time? I do. I think uh, I think it's going to. I think it's sustainable over time because General Milley is growing leaders in his image, uh, individuals who understand what the needs of the Army will be uh, years out into the future. He, he's all about the technology, the leadership development, uh, and getting after the enemy. Okay. So what advice would you give the Army or Department of Defense leadership today regarding managing diversity? We have to always be cognizant of managing diversity. It is an ongoing... It's People... Uh, normally form relationships and associations um, with like-minded people. And if we don't have direct involvement by leaders to make sure that everyone has a, uh equal opportunity and there there is a level playing field, it's not something that we can do passively. We have to actively be involved in diversity. Mm -hmm. We have to look for it if it's not there and ensure that it's there. We're stronger with diversity. So one of the things we talk about within our military is the role of mentorship. So how are you involved in mentoring programs uh, to help the next generation of leaders? So I'm heavily involved with the ROCKS. The ROCKS is an organization that's been around about 40 years and it's all about leadership. It is um, predominantly African-American, but we have quite a few non-African American members and we follow the Army's mentorship model and we just apply it. So it's direct, active mentorship. Uh, that is, uh, I would not be a general officer without the ROCKS directly involved in my career. So diversity is a significant consideration for our military for both functional and social reasons. In your experience, how does the Army use diversity to enhance organizational performance? I think the, the United States Army uses diversity to make sure that uh, we have a, a, a different view on things. So there, there's different strengths. People bring um, a variety of experiences that um, brought together make, make the organization stronger. I think the Army uses diversity, especially right now, uh, quite effectively. How does the Army demonstrate its diversity and inclusion for broad, broader political purposes? The Army does this through uh, its, its public affairs apparatus, and, and just by example, when you when you walk around the Pentagon and you see the number of African American generals at the one, two, three star level, as I mentioned early, earlier, unprecedented number of African Americans at the three star level. Um, we need some work at the four star level, but at the three star level, I think ten is the largest number I've seen in my career. So the Army. How does the Army get this out to the public? Uh, by these 10 general officers and General Brooks uh, are, I believe, our sole four-star is um, take take opportunities to get out to the public. And um, But I think the public is aware, uh, for the most part, 
that the army is progressive. The army has always led the way in um, in the de- in the civil rights e- effort. So, what are some of the challenges that to effective integration that you've experienced during your military career? I would say the challenges that I experienced were were limited to like the awareness. A lot of times, I was the only one uh, when I joined mm-hmm. uh, in eighty one. Um, the Army was not where it is today. So the challenges I faced, there were occasions when I was one of two, one of three, um, and that puts you in a position where you have to sometimes work even harder because where do you go for help? Where do you go for an example? Where where do you go for mentorship and guidance? And that's where the ROCKS uh, mentorship organization came came in for me. And I saw African-American officers just leave. As soon as they could, they left. The, the, they gave up. So um, the Army has come a long way since 1981. So in your current positions, how do these insights help you as a commander and working in the National Guard or District of Columbia? So my experience has helped me that I'm cognizant of uh, the power of diversity. And I, and I look at diversity across the spectrum. How many women do we have? How many um, uh, minorities do we have from um, racial and ethnic groups? And I try to make sure as long as you're competent, capable, and you meet our standards, uh, I'm going to give you an opportunity. Okay. Thank you. Uh, One more question. There seems to be evidence of de facto segregation within the Army by certain military occupational specialties or career fields. What do you think this is caused by? I agree. That you, you don't see as many African Americans in combat arms. You don't see as many in um, infantry and field artillery. You don't see that many in military intelligence. So, But I happen to be an MI officer, military, military intelligence officer. So, uh, But I asked myself, why do certain branches? And I came up with two reasons. The first reason is that maybe it's a lack of interest in those branches. I I only wanted to be a military intelligence officer. And then perhaps the second thing is that not knowing is that certain branches are where the generals come from. In the Army, predominantly um, field artillery, infantry, and armor are where the generals come from. Uh, So maybe perhaps going into the Army, uh, I think there's a a little more awareness needs to be or more emphasis placed on why you might want to be an infantry officer. Everyone doesn't want to be a general or even a colonel, but if you do want to be a general, you might want to think about infantry or or armor or field artillery. Uh, But I, I think people are drawn to what interests them. So what's the role of role models then within promoting diversity and managing diversity in the force? So so role models, um, so some of my role models were not infantry or armor or field artillery. Um, they were MI officers. They were signal officers. As the Army develops a electronic warfare officer, what what is that career path going to look, going to look like? It might not lead to rapid advancement, but one, a soldier has to decide, an officer has to decide, where are they going to go in the Army? But uh, to, to get to the root of your question, I believe, um, how do we get officers into these branches that are career, that, that are seem to be a path toward becoming a GO? Mm-hmm. And, and there's essentially three branches that kind of lead to becoming a GO. And what was the path that you took to, one, join the United States Army, but then stay with it? So I always wanted to serve in the United States Army, uh, and I also always wanted to be a special agent with the Drug Enforcement Administration. So I was blessed to be able to join the National Guard and uh, and was able to have a dual-track career, um, and I stayed with DEA for 30-plus years, and, and I had a successful career and was able to manage and have a successful career with the Army as well. Um, I was just very, very fortunate to have great mentors that took an interest in me and told me, hey, you might want to do this, you might want to do that. And most importantly, I listened to them. So when they suggested this course or that class, take this assignment, you want this command, you want to do the War College, you want to go to um, CASCube, 
followed by immediately followed by CGSC. You want to come up and do the defense strategy course at the Army War College. And I, I listened to him. So I had people whispering in my ear. I had coaches, mentors, and sponsors, and sometimes one person was all three. Okay. You mentioned before your role models and mentors may not have been the same ethnic background as you as an African-American. So do you believe that we are now in a post-racial military? No, we're not in a post-racial military. The predominant, most of my mentors were African-Americans, but I did have some non-African-American mentors who uh, were very inf influential in my career, both in, as a federal civilian and as an Army officer. So I had mentors. I had whites, uh, blacks, women, uh, Hispanics. I had mentors. Uh, and I don't know if I look lost, but everybody would come up to me and say, hey, you want to do this, you want to do that, and I listen to them. So we'll, I don't believe we'll ever be in a post-racial um, environment where we don't need to think about diversity. It, uh, there will be this regression to the norm. If we walk away from it and think we've solved it, it will come back. So you think that we still have to manage diversity and integration within the force? We absolutely have to manage uh, diversity and integration in the United States military in the United States Army. Mm -hmm. Any closing comments? Glad to be here with you this afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. Well, General Walker, I'd like to thank you for again for being here with your time and your candid conversation with me today. I think you've given us a lot to think about as we reflect on the continued importance and legacy of the EO-9981 to the United States military. And that concludes our program. Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this podcast reflect those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or positions of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. Let us know what you think. Provide us your feedback, comments, or suggestions through our webpage at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. And have a great day.